I'll continue my introduction by saying that my name really is John Smith. Uh, I'm often asked that. Uh, you'd be surprised. Um, I'm here today to talk about a uh, book I'm writing, uh, to talk about uh, perseverance and integrity. Um, I uh, uh, want to tell you a little bit about uh, The Abyss. There was a movie, Wall Street, the original Wall Street scene. There was uh, Hal Holbrook and uh, Charlie Sheen were in it. Charlie Sheen. Uh, tire blood and Adonis DNA, right? Didn't work for him in this movie. Anyway, he was uh, coming quickly down the hallway and didn't know that the feds were in the back getting ready to bust him. Uh, Hal Holbrook stops him, puts his hand on his shoulder and says to him, if you remember anything, remember this, that when a man looks into the abyss and nothing looks back at him, that's when a man finds his character. Um, have you all seen that movie? Anybody seen that? Um, the, it's a Hollywood version of a statement actually made by a German philosopher by the name of Friedrich Nietzsche. Friedrich Nietzsche said that the longer you gaze into the abyss, the longer the abyss gazes back into you. And, of course, that is reference to um, consciousness. That's what it is. My book uh, is entitled Embracing the Abyss. It is a, uh, it's a nonfiction work. It's a story about uh, fraud and deception during the uh, SNL days, told by an insider who was not part of the looting that was going on uh, by the CEO, but was nevertheless included in a $540 million lawsuit by the FSLIC and various criminal charges. Uh, without a cooperation agreement, he pled guilty to one felony count, uh, went on to become a witness for the government for a period of 14 years, and uh, saved the government thousands of hours and millions of dollars. 20 years later, after pleading guilty, George W. Bush granted him a presidential pardon. I am this person. So how did we get here? How did all this come about? Well, a, an author we, you might recognize tells us that history doesn't necessarily repeat itself, but it sure do rhyme. Uh, similarities are amazing between the SNLs and the problems they were having once upon a time and the big banks today. The striking similarity or the scary similarity is the government and its involvement back then and what they did and the government's involvement in what they're doing now. Back then, they called it regulatory changes. Just deregulation was the key word, deregulation. And what they did was they made a bunch of changes to allow SNLs to be able to earn their way out. Some of these changes were um, changing the accounting rules, softening them so that the banks, the SNLs, would look better on paper, much like what's recently happened with the big banks. Nobody really knows how big that black hole is with shadow inventory and housing uh, on the toxic asset side of the balance sheets. Nobody really knows. Uh, two, they uh, reduced the lending restrictions where SNLs could make a loan on almost anything imaginable. Um, three, they encouraged... Um, entrepreneurs and developers to become owners of savings and loans, thinking that these people know how to take a loan and make money from it, so they ought to know how to make a loan from the other side of the desk. Well, that worked to an extent, but what we got from all of that was two things. One was a moral hazard, and two were zombie SNLs. Today, who knows? We know that, uh, or, or at least told by Dorothy and Toto, once upon a time, that the wizard turned out to be just a guy with white hair playing an organ behind a curtain. Today we got a guy with no hair playing a printing press in broad daylight. Where it leads, I don't know. Uh, being in the, in, in, in the business of real estate, I had thought that we might be seeing some daylight by now, maybe looking into 212 or 213. I don't think so, but that's just an opinion. Got ethics. At the SNL, I watched it. I watched it grow from a balance sheet of $80 million to $1.4 billion in a matter of four years. Four years. That's a lot of growth. That's a lot of high flying. I was the compliance guy. I was the one trying to keep up with the loan manuals to see that things were done right. 
or any transactions that were supposed to occur in terms of sales or, or purchases were done correctly according to the accounting rules. Tremendous amount of growth. And it brought along a lot of problems as well. Supervisory agreements, things such as that. Another form of regulation. The regulators came in and took over most of the SNLs at a point. Uh, I had tired of, of it. Thought I would go into uh, uh, consulting business because I knew what made SNLs work. I knew about loan manuals. I knew about policies. I knew about those kinds of things. Uh, what I didn't know was that I had been thrown deep into the briar patch by having worked at this place called Vernon Savings. They wanted to have much to do with me. I'd call them on the phone and be talking to them, and they'd say, okay, you can come out and talk to us, but when you're here, please don't touch anything. It was like I had the plague. Here's a guy that sat on one end of the building and said to himself, I'm not part of what they're doing at the other end of the building. I've my job, got my job to do, and I can do the right thing here, then everything's going to be okay. Not. What I didn't know then is how political things had become. Political, because every SNL owner had the ear of Jim Wright, congressman, speaker of the house from Fort Worth. And every weekend, the owners would call him and talk to him and tell him, we can't make any money. We can't earn our way out. You've got to get the regulators off of our backs. But what the owners weren't telling him was all the other stuff that they were doing, lavish lifestyles, where the money went, who knows, that type of thing. Nevertheless, Jim Wright believed them. Jim Wright would then get on the telephone and get up Ed Gray, chairman of the family home on bank board, and bend his ear. Get off of him. Leave him alone. Let him do what they need to do. That served one thing. Served to make everybody just mad. Made the regulators mad. When they started forming a task force, the FBI came to town. They were mad. And let me tell you, when they came to town, they were looking for, for, for blood and guts and headlines. You know, they, they, let's just, we'll, we'll just kick some right now and take names later on. That was their attitude. What I learned from this is that the lawyers... Oh, I forgot to tell you. I had a certain way about uh, uh, dealing with this because... Um, one day a constable came to my doorstep in Coppell, and he had this huge box, and he asked me if I was John Smith. Now, are you really John Smith? Again. And, um, I said, yes. I drug it inside, went through, started going through it, and found, you name it, was there. Fraud, racketeering, conspiracy, looting the public trust. And I, and I thought, well, don't they know I didn't do that? Don't they know that I wasn't part of that? Don't they know that I was the admin guy? What I didn't know was that the records that they were looking at said that I was on an executive committee. Never saw it. Never had a meeting with it. Nevertheless, that's what the paper said. So when they filed for the, against the top six guys, I was one of them. It didn't matter that I didn't fly off to California on the jets or get on the yachts or smooch with the politicians or play with the prostitutes. None of that mattered. I was too busy playing coach in, in Coppell, Little League football, peewee football, little league baseball, didn't have time for it. What I did find out is that this didn't work. I kept thinking it's going to go away. They're going to realize I'm not the guy. They don't want me here. I had this net theory where you take this, see the Greek fisherman on the side of the seashore. He throws this huge thing out and reels in his catch and he starts going through it and I'm thinking the feds are any day going to be going through their catch here and they're going to say, What's this fish Smith doing here? Smith doesn't belong here. Throw him back. Boom. Never happened. But it didn't stop me from thinking it. It didn't stop me from believing that that was going to happen someday.